welcome to Grace Baptist Church. We're delighted you're here with us to worship Jesus Christ. Our theme this morning is Soldiers of Christ Arise. We are in a spiritual battle. Ephesians 6, 10, and 11 says this, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles or the schemes of the devils. We want to sing of that this morning. So let's begin by singing Soldiers of Christ Arise. Let's stand to sing. so glad that you've joined us here one week after Easter. What a tremendous time we had last week. 
You may have seen your bulletin. I think the number of visitors we had last week exceeded any other outreach we've ever had. I sure appreciate the hard work of all the servants in the church, getting things like our sunrise service ready, the breakfast, which was well attended. It was just a great day that the Lord gave us, and we're so thankful that you're here this morning. Please take your Bibles and turn to Mark 14, the Gospel of Mark in chapter 14. While you're finding your place, I also wanted to mention just uh, what a thrill it was as we think of the number of people that visited as we're following up on individuals and to have several guests with us this morning as well. So we pray that the services will be a blessing to you as we look into God's word. So you're finding your place now in the gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 14. I'm going to ask Jeff Tobor to come. He is going to be reading for us from the scriptures, Mark chapter 14, verses 32 through 38, and leading us in prayer this morning. Good morning. Good morning. morning. Reading from the book of Mark. Then they came to a place which was named Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took Peter, James, and John with him, and he began to be troubled and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch. He went a little further and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And that he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Then he came and found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, why are you sleeping? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit is indeed the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for showing us your power with the wind, with the cold, with the seasons. And Lord, we just we just lift up to you in prayer today. Father, thank you for always staying awake for us. Even through our weakness, we may fall asleep. We know that you're there with us, always awake, always guiding, always guarding us. Father, we give you praise that over the Easter services this past weekend, Father, the the services that we celebrate your fantastic promise, that we had nearly 62 visitors over our events. Father, we pray for an effective follow-up for our our newcomers to our church. And Father, we just pray that you continue to grow this church as the beacon in Parker and the beacon for your ministry, Lord. We also lift up to you our missions, Sarah and Dylan Renner from the United Kingdom. And Father, we lift up their homeless outreach to you. We lift up their sword club in which they're busing uh, underprivileged folks in to hear your word. And Father, we lift up all of the growth that's happening in that church, Father. And Lord, finally, we lift up our church workday volunteers, Lord, the men and women that you've called to serve in a capacity that keeps the church going, that keeps the facility running, and it keeps us all coming back each Sunday, Lord. Father God, we just thank you. We thank you for all the blessings you give to us. And Father, we ask that you, as always, come quickly come soon, Father, but Lord, until that day, give us the strength to carry on. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Second Timothy 2, 3, it tells us we are to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Let's continue our singing this morning, Am I a Soldier of the Cross? You may remain seated as we sing.
Let's stand and sing, oh church arise and put your armor on. There's a call of Christ, our captain. Please take your Bibles and turn to the Gospel of Mark, Mark 14. And while we're turning our Bibles, we'll dismiss our children for children's church service. They'll be dismissed out the back doors while we're finding Mark chapter 14. So good to have Molly Roth back with us. She went on a five-week training for uh, military duty, and we're so glad that she's back safe. Praise God for our military. And our own youth pastor, Jake, should be home Saturday, okay? And uh, so much going on there. I wanted to compliment Pastor Joel with the selection of music this morning. When you think about being a soldier for Christ, when you think about being fortified spiritually, we're going to see a passage where somebody gets an A plus today, but others did not. Where are we at in that? Jesus had to steel himself against the great trial that was coming up against him. Now, beginning my message this morning, I wanted to ask you a question. Can you think of a time when you were so deeply troubled that you had to have a very close friend or family member with you? Perhaps it was a time when you were in the hospital. You got the phone call. You rushed to the hospital, and your loved one is in a room where you can't be. You understand that. You wish you could be there. And you're sitting nervously in a waiting room, waiting for that doctor to come out through those doors and give you the news. At a time like that, you want to have someone that knows you, that loves you, that cares about you, that cares about the situation like you do. Isn't that what's true about us and our humanity? What about if, God forbid, but what about things are going really well, but there's a failed relationship? I mean, you get blindsided. That terrible word that starts with a D, divorce, and you're served in that way. A failed relationship. Wouldn't you want someone that understands and is sympathetic, that is empathetic with you at that time? That reminds me of this passage that Brother Jeff read for us this morning, where Jesus is going to go through a very troubling time. And he needs someone with him to spiritually bolster him, to fortify him, to steal him in his desire to do what is right. In fact, the title of my message this morning, I borrow it from, uh, from Hughes, is The Stealing of the Church. 
the stealing of the church. Now, when we think about steel, I know there are other metals that are more exotic and per, per pound they can be stronger, but steel has been around forever. Nerves of steel. We have all these cliches. Strong as steel. But sometimes in our Christian lives, we need to be fortified and we need to be strong, even as steel is, as a metal. Stealing the church. Today we're going to see in three aspects that Jesus needed to be steeled, the disciples did, and the church did as well. So being perfectly human, Jesus wanted companionship as he was about to face the cross. He was God. He knew the anguish that was coming. But it wasn't just the pain, and we'll say more about that later. It was the spiritual separation that he went through. So at this time of great need and and in his humanity, he wanted someone, someone that understood would be empathetic, someone close to him. So he, he picks the three that had often been with him, Peter, James, and John. And they are with him at this strategic time as he's praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, it's interesting to know, and Wearsby brought this out, but if you'll remember, there are three times that he calls Peter, James, and John to be with him very strategic times. For example, <clears throat> the first one in Scripture would be the healing of Jairus' daughter. She had died, and they were mourning her death, and yet Jesus said, oh, she is not dead, she's asleep. They mocked him. Oh, she's dead, but he went up, and because of the power of the resurrection, he raised Jairus' daughter. Who was with him? Peter, James, and John. Then you remember the Mount of Transfiguration in chapter 9? Not all the disciples went with him, but Jesus chose these inner three. And they went with him and saw Jesus in his glorified form. It gives us a picture of what we're going to be like in heaven, the transfiguration. That's Mark chapter 9. And then, of course, here he calls the same three, Peter, James, and John, to be with him at a very emotionally and spiritually difficult time. Now, here's what Wearsby brought to my attention. I I thought this was, I've never seen this before, but think of Philippians 3.10. Many of you know the verse. That I may know him. That speaks of the Mount of Transfiguration when they saw him glorified. And the power of his resurrection. That speaks of Jairus. Remember Jairus and the daughter was raised. And the fellowship of his sufferings. That is the Garden of Eden. So as we think about that today, let's pray that God would use this passage in our lives. Father, I pray that by the power of your spirit today, that you would show yourself strong That God, because of the power of the resurrection, showing that you are God, that you have power over death, hell, and the grave. That God, your resurrection assures our own. That God, we can be certain in this day and age that we are ready for eternity because we've trusted you as Savior. And I pray if there's anyone here this morning who has never trusted you as Savior, I pray that today would be their day of salvation in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's look at just some simple ideas this morning. The stealing of the church, making it strong. And I chose this picture for good reason. It's not necessarily great finances, but thank God for giving people like we have here. It's not necessarily big numbers, but it's the force, the spiritual force of prayer where every believer can fold their hands and pray to a God who hears. Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee my great and mighty things which thou knowest not, the Bible says. The stealing of the church. But in this passage today, we're going to begin with simply this idea. Jesus had to go through a time when he was spiritually fortified, the stealing of Jesus. Follow with me if you would, starting in verse 32. Then they, the disciples, and Jesus came to the place which is named Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. Sit here while I pray. He went to Gethsemane. Now what is Gethsemane? The the word literally means oil press. Now, we don't know if this was the very one on the east side of Jerusalem. But what was known about the area is so many olive trees. There were stone walls that surrounded it. It was an awesome place to be private for prayer. Whether it was a a wealthy family that knew Jesus and said, you can come here anytime to pray. Uh, But this was a, a place where Jesus would frequent um, this place in Gethsemane, which means oil press. The Bible says, and as I mentioned earlier, look at verse 33. And he took those three disciples, Peter, James, and John, with him. And he began to be troubled and deeply distressed. Very heavy. Let's look at these words a little bit. 
Before we jump into these words, though, I, I love what Hebert said about taking Peter, James, and John. He said this, Having been chosen to behold His glories on the Mount of Transfiguration, now they are chosen to witness the extreme opposite, His deepest agony of soul. That's who you want by you when you're really hurting, isn't it? Those who know you best. So, Jesus was troubled. What does this word mean? It means a feeling of terrified amazement in the face of the dreadful prospect of bearing God's full fury against sin. That's what he is up against. Jesus at this time was in the grip of terror. Jesus' usual calm gave place to agitation of spirit in his humanity. He knew not only the physical suffering of the cross, which we talked about last Sunday, but he also knew of the spiritual separation he would have to endure from his heavenly father for the first time. The Bible says not only was he troubled, but he was deeply distressed. That phrase means t terrified, surprised. Something that is so overwhelming, it comes upon you like a flood and you feel drowned in the sorrow. This is what Jesus is going through. How bad was it? Well, look at verse 34. <clears throat> Don't miss this. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Death. Wow. Even to death, the Bible says. Stay here and watch. He commands them to be spiritually alert while he goes a distance. We'll say more about that later. Even to death. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> we as men, you know, we're, we're always strong, you know. We don't need anyone, right? Ouch. Oh, we don't need to admit our weaknesses. Ouch. Can you imagine being in such emotional and spiritual anguish that you would say, I I'm to the point of it hurts so bad it's like being in, it's like death. It's like I'm in the grips of death. What transparency Jesus had. Let me ask you a question. Are you transparent? How are you doing in your spiritual life? When you have needs, you at least admit, admit them to God. I'm not saying that every time you have a need, you got to tell the whole world. But Jesus, with his closest friends, tells them, it's so bad, I'm at the point of death. Transparency. I think of our men's Bible study. I think of the men that come, and even like a couple weeks ago, even a visitor to our group transparently shared where his marriage was, and it was failing. No one asked him to do this. This is the transparency, the humility of his soul. His marriage was failing at a certain time. But he's begun, begun to come to church and get back into the Bible. And now God is working in his life. Are you transparent? You're not going to grow in your spiritual life, I don't feel, if you're not transparent with God. God already knows where you're struggling. So why wouldn't you ask him for help? Why would you keep that back from those who care about you most? Jesus didn't. He was so transparent here. He said, even unto death. And there's a lesson for us to learn here. The sorrow was so great that it threatened to crush the life out of Jesus. It's so bad. And remember, when we go through the Gospels, <clears throat> there are four Gospels, we know that. But each of these Gospels, especially Matthew and Luke, have other comments. Let me tell you something that most of you know. But let me look at a verse here. It's Luke twenty two forty four, 44, a parallel passage. And Jesus, being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. The medical term is hemoditrosis. And that is where the capillaries with, within you burst. And blood is mingled with sweat. So not only is this a, uh, a biblically accurate statement, but doctors have noted that there are times when you're under such emotional and spiritual anguish that... Hematidrosis can happen, and this is what our Savior was going through, because my sin and your sin was going to be placed upon him. He was going to be the sacrificial lamb. He was going to die for the sins of the world, for all of our sins. So he staggered under the weight of the emotional and spiritual impact of the alienation from his father, and that horrified him. Now, I love how Hughes summarizes this. He said this, Jesus underwent a stress of cosmic dimensions, the greatest in the chronicles of the universe. 
I quote him because I feel that he has nailed what Jesus is going through. Sometimes we read the Bible and we read it quickly and we don't pause to see that he was troubled and he was greatly distressed to the point even of death. That's what Jesus went through for me and for you in order to pay for the sins of mankind. So how was this so bad? Well, let's, let's get some theology here and remind, be reminded what 2 Corinthians says. For God, the Father, made him Jesus who knew no sin. There was no sin in Jesus. He was the sinless Lamb of God. But Jesus was made sin for us. That's everyone in this room. That we might become the righteousness of God in him. Don't miss the teaching here. It's kind of like this. There was an exchange. We had sin and unrighteousness and we offered it up to God as ugly as it was. And in place of our unrighteousness, in place of our sin, Jesus placed his righteousness upon us. You know what that means? If you're a Christian this morning, if you've trusted Christ as Savior, you know that. When Jesus looks at you, he sees righteousness because you've trusted him. That's what Jesus did for us. In order for this to happen... The sin of the world had to be placed on Jesus. And as his father looked at him, his father had to turn his back on sin. Because what does it say in Psalm, I think it's Psalm 5 verse 4. That God is a pure eyes than to look on iniquity. God cannot be in the presence of iniquity. Therefore, he couldn't be with his son at that time in that manner. Wow. So. When we talk about even unto death, all that Jesus is going to go through, when we think about that, it's not just the cruelty of the cross. And I preached on that last week. I'll not repeat it this morning. The the real cruelty, it wasn't just Israel's rejection or Judas' defection or the disciples' um, desertion. Nor was it the injustice of the religious leaders, the mockery of the Roman soldiers, or even the impending reality of his physical death. That's not the greatest stress upon him. What really came upon him was the fact that the father must turn his back on his own son. So what does he say here at the end of the verse, verse 34? Knowing what he's about to go through, he says, stay here, be close to me and watch. Be spiritually alert. Stay here. You know, the disciples needed to learn. They needed to grow in their complete comprehension of the reality of spiritual warfare. Look with me at another parallel passage. Luke 22 and verse 40, Bible says. When he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not, not enter into temptation. Jesus knew That the upcoming moments, literally, well, hour and then moments after that, was going to be a time of terrible temptation, desertion. And that they needed to be spiritually prepared for that. May I ask you this? When's the last time you were so spiritually concerned about something? You were so spiritually burdened about something that you spent, you you missed a meal, just maybe a, a short fast to pray. Or you missed a day to pray. Where are you at in spiritual warfare? The disciples weren't there. We're about to find out as we read more verses about Jesus being steeled in prayer and them falling asleep in prayer. Been there, done that. Got to tell you a story. (laughs) I I was at my Bible college and it was a red hot Bible college. Great men of God would preach and people were being saved and people were being baptized. It was a great atmosphere. And boy, did they preach on prayer. And I wanted to be a better... I want to be better in my prayers. So in, in my freshman year, uh, in that front room there, uh, there was a bunk bed. I, I had the top bunk. And I said, well, I'm praying in the morning. I pray throughout the day. I'm going to get on my knees, and I'm going to pray there at the bottom bunk before I go to bed. I want to be more spiritual, you know. So I want to pray. Well, that night I was exhausted. And uh, <laughs> that night, you know, I prayed. I was so tired. I must have fallen asleep. And then in my delusional thinking, I crawled into bed. It wasn't mine. It was my buddy's. Now, that wasn't bad, as bad as what about to happen. You see, my buddy worked a very late shift. So I was probably going to bed at about midnight, you know. He came in about 1 a.m. That night, it was terrible, but that night, he was in the kitchen, and he cut himself terribly. 
his hand, and he had to go to the, to the hospital, I guess, get stitches. So he comes home, and he wants to get in bed. And who's there? Ward Smith. <laughs> so <laughs> he had to crawl up. He was so humble and so polite, he didn't say, dude, get out of my bed. Uh, he had to crawl up into my bunk. Well, sometimes our greatest desires to be spiritual aren't always what they should be. But I want to tell you, Jesus steeled himself in prayer while the disciples slept. You ever been there? I have. Sometimes we just don't understand how we need to be spiritually fortified. And we need to be careful in this realm. So here the double command uh, to the three shows his desire for solitude and sympathy in his struggle. And then Jay Vernon brought out something, but I want to ask you a question. There's a song that says, I'll go with him through the garden. And it repeats it several times. I like the song. But here's what Jay Vernon said. Can we really go through, through, can we really go with him through the garden? Let me read this as a testimony of a humble pastor. Did he, Jesus, face the tempter again here in the garden? I think he did. I must be very frank and say that we can only stand here on the fringe, on the outskirts. There are mysteries in the garden that we cannot understand. I think it is audacious and actually borders on the blasphemous for people to sing, I'll go with him through the garden. I'm sorry, friend. If you don't mind, I'll beg off. I can't go with him through the garden. You don't know how weak and stumbling and bumbling I really am. I can't go with him through the garden, but I will stand on the edge and watch him and pray. He asked us to watch and pray so that we can so that we enter not a temptation. Let's go back to what we learned from this verse. Jesus, in a parallel passage in Luke, exhorted them that they wouldn't enter in temptation. Now, we know what's about to come if we've read our Bibles, but this was Jesus' will for them. We always pray the best for people, don't we? They don't always achieve that or live up to it, but we always ought to pray the best for people. Look at verse 35. Bible says, and he, Jesus, went a little farther and fell on the ground and prayed that if, if it was within the Father's will, if it were possible, that the hour, the events that are about to happen might pass from him, if it be possible. Jesus asked the Father if the cross might be avoidable within the framework of God's redemptive purposes. He asked that in his humanity. He asked to be saved not from death, but out of death, that, that is raised from the dead, and the Father granted him his request. Now, in my study, I found a passage I thought was very helpful. Look with me at Hebrews chapter 5, starting in verse 7. Who, in the days of his flesh, speaking of Jesus, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from the death, him being the Father, who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear, verse 8 and 9, though he was a son, yet he learned, wow, obedience by the things which he suffered. And I'm thinking, he's God and he's learning obedience. The ladies uh, uh, studied this in their ladies' Bible study in their last book. This is a powerful phrase. But even God learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Anybody sign up for suffering this week? Say, here's my to-do list. I want to suffer. That's not a natural response. I beg you, and I use the word, I, I ask you, don't miss Bible study hour today. It's the last in a series that talks about how God grows us through suffering. The title of the Bible study hour lesson today is Why Bad Things Happen to Good People. And there's a scriptural answer for that. Don't miss that, our 11 o'clock hour. We have multiple classes you could attend. So Jesus learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation. We can be saved through him, through those who obey him by calling on his name. Very important parallel passage that helped me to understand this fuller. So he talks about the hour. That's, of course, the event. It's, it's, it's everything. The betrayal, uh, Jesus' trials, his mockery, his crucifixion. The hour is coming. It's upon him. And outside of the cross itself, this had to have been the apex of his suffering. Look at verse 36. The Bible says, And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take, and that's, a, that's an imperative here. This is a command. 
Jesus is asking sternly, take this cup from me, Dad. (laughs) And I'm not being irreverent because the word Abba literally means Daddy. It was a very intimate term. We'll say more about that later. Take this cup away from me, Father. Nevertheless, don't miss this. Can't stop with that. Nevertheless, not what I will, but as you will. So we mentioned Abba, this intimate term, Daddy, is how we could um, translate it in the English language. It was so intimate that Jews did not use it as a personal address to God since it was such a familial term and it was considered inappropriate for prayer. So is Jesus inappropriate here? No, not when you understand his intimate relationship with the Father. Daddy, I'm hurting. You ever gone to God that way? Oh, we're, we're adults. We're grown up. We don't admit our needs. We don't admit our weaknesses. If that's you, no wonder you're not growing. No wonder you're struggling. It's not how Jesus reacted in his time of deep spiritual anguish. Daddy, he cried out. You know, Jesus' use of Abba in addressing God is is new and unique. And we don't want to hurry by that term. Oh, the intimacy between Jesus and his Father displayed in total surrender to the Father's will. So Jesus' primary concern in drinking the cup of God's judgment on sin was necessarily disrupted by this relationship, the father turning his back on him. And then in verse 36, he says, all things are possible for you. And thinking about that, one commentator brought out the idea that Jesus was recognizing that the father could have provided salvation in any way he chose, but from the foundation of the world, from Genesis, book of Isaiah 52, 53, all throughout scripture, this was prophesied, Psalm 22. But don't miss his last phrase, not what I will, but what you will. Jesus was wholly into doing the will of his Father. Look with me at John 6. Jesus said, for I have come down from heaven not, not to do my own will, but the will of him, the Father who sent me. There are many verses like this, but I just wanted to give you this one. Jesus was all about the Father's will, doing that. So Jesus' will was distinct from the Father, but never in opposition to the Father's will. So he talks about the cup. We're still in verse 36, where it te- so he says, take this cup away from me, this cup. What was all the suffering he would go through, the agony of soul resulting from bearing the guilt of the lost world? Mark 15 comments on it in this way in verse 34. He says, and he cries out from the cross, my God, my God, Why? Have you forsaken me? Now, if you've never heard this before, and and, and I wanted to illustrate it, it's like God is looking on his son, and he knows that this is the plan to redeem mankind, so wordsmith one day, and you could go to heaven. But when the sins of the world were placed upon him, the father turned his back on his own son, and that's when Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus was forsaken, so you never have to be. Did you hear that? So you never have to be. That's what Jesus did for us on the cross. So Jesus saw in this cup two things. Number one, he saw the cup was full of sin. Full of sin. Jesus saw the brutality, the fierceness of mankind, the wickedness, the immorality of all earthly civilizations, the profanity. It was a cup brimming with jealousy, hatred, and covetousness. But he must drink it the sins of the world must be placed upon him and Jesus recoiled from that wouldn't you it was not only a cup full of sin but number two was a cup full of wrath a cup full of wrath as sin bearer he became the object of the father's holy wrath against sin think of it think of it we already looked at 2 Corinthians 2 uh, or 5.21 where it says that God the Father hath made Jesus to be sin for us because Jesus knew no sin. The sin of mankind was placed upon him. So the cup, he must drink it. You see, Jesus became a curse for us. We see that in Galatians 3.13. Christ has redeemed us or saved us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. Don't miss that. Becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Jesus went through that. He took the curse upon himself that you and I might be saved. 
So the agony of Saul was so extreme that the father sent an angel to strengthen him in Luke twenty two forty three. 43. I love how Hughes comments on this verse. He said, in the greatest display of obedience and will ever that can be known, Jesus took the full chalice of man's sin and God's wrath, looked at it, shuddered deep into its depth, and in a steel act of his will, drank it all. This is what Jesus did for us, and that's why we exalt him, or him at Grace Baptist Church. You can feel like you're the lowest of sinners, and God will receive you today. You don't have to clean up your life first. You don't have to prove that you're worthy, because quite frankly, I'm not worthy and you're not worthy. But Jesus, in his love and forgiveness, died so that we might have that forgiveness. So how did Jesus forge his will in alignment with his Father? In the three recorded occurrences of Jesus praying in the book of Mark, I was, I was amazed to see this. First of all, in, in the earlier chapters, he prayed in the hour of temptation when, when he had fasted 40 days and Satan was tempting him. Notice three characteristics when he prayed, because there's three times that Jesus prayed in a very specific way. And the three characteristics are, it was night, he was alone, he was in solitude, and there was demonic pressures against him. Spiritual warfare. So that was in chapter 1 at the time of temptation. And then in the, in the middle of his ministry, and then here at the end, Mark saw that these events as fundamental to understanding Jesus. In other words, if you want to be like Jesus... If you want to be like Jesus, you need to steal yourself in prayer. And that's my first point this morning. Jesus steeled himself in prayer. That's what he did. So without his father's strength through prayer, he would never have made it, one commentator said. I, he would never have made it. Well, in his humanity, no. So if Jesus needs to be strengthened through fervent prayer, how much more do you and I? So may I ask you a question? How is your prayer life? You know, one thing that we've done recently, and if you're not on our email list, there's a connection card. Please put your name and email on that. But one thing we've tried to do to strengthen, to steal ourselves in corporate prayer so we're all on the same page, this is our new prayer bulletin started in January. I love it. It's very organized. Each day has something to pray for. It's a big bulletin. It'd be hard to, some people could pray through this the whole, the whole time, but we break it down into seven days. Are you using certain tools like this so you can pray for others, corporate prayer? It's good to pray here in church, and we do that many times, but how important it is at home as well. So we really just have two ideas this morning, the stealing of Jesus, and now we're going to see the stealing of the disciples. Okay, G, uh, our, our music group, and we sang great songs on being soldiers, and Jesus gets an A+, because he gets fortified. So how did the disciples do? Let's look at verse 37. The Bible says, Then he came and found them sleeping. And the verb said, it's almost like he chided Peter. Simon, didn't call him Peter because that means a, a rock or a stone. Simon, are you sleeping? Could you not watch with me one hour? I can't tell you that the only prayer that is valid in heaven is a one-hour prayer. I would never say that. But I will say what Scripture says. There are times when our souls are under such anguish and there's spiritual warfare around us that we ought to be able to pray for an hour. When's the last time you prayed for an hour? Doesn't happen very often, does it? You could if you're spiritually exercised and believing in the one who can deliver. So here it is. We have that, and let's look at a parallel passage again in Luke 22, and this will become, this will become our uh, memory verse, actually the next verse. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked you, asked for you, that he may sift you, he may sift you as wheat. Simon was the meat, that was the wheat. But uh, let me go back with this. Verse 32 will actually be, be our memory verse, and it's in your bulletin. We'll say more about that later. So, okay, so Peter fails. He said, I'll never deny you. <laughs> and he's about to fail, and we know that from the next passage. But let's remember that Peter 
came back. He wrote a book in the New Testament called 1 Peter and 2 Peter. And what did he say in 1 Peter 5 eight? Friends, Christians, be sober, be vigilant. For your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, drink down whole, destroy. So Peter had to learn, like most of us, <laughs> from experience, the, the school of hard knocks, so to speak. But I'm glad that he didn't stay down. What, what if you had a dis- disappointment in life and you stayed down from that spiritually? What if, what, what if you used to say, well, I used to pray, but then God didn't answer a certain prayer and I don't pray anymore. Well, I used to give out tracts to unsaved people, but you know, somebody got mad at me one time, so I don't do it anymore. Well, I, I used to read my Bible, but you know, I don't know. At the end of the day, I couldn't remember what I read, and it's probably not doing any good. And Can I say something? For those of you who would say coming to a church service, reading your Bible, memorizing a verse doesn't do any good, apply that to the physical realm. Don't eat any food. Oh, that food's not doing any good. <laughs> We're going to have to get a wheelchair to get you in here if you believe that long enough. You'll be so weakened. You might not remember the 21 meals, or for some of us more than that, that you ate last week, okay? But every one of those meals gave you spiritual nourishment. Don't forget it. So, Jesus commands him to watch. Look at verse 38. Watch means keep alert. Pray. These are both imperatives. Watch and pray. Guys, don't, don't, don't be falling asleep here. Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. There it is again. We saw it in Luke also. The spirit indeed is willing. Hey, you guys want to do what's right. Ah, but the flesh is weak. There's the problem. So watch. Keep your spiritual eyes open for the enemy is near. Are you aware and spiritually discerning during this attack? Jesus, it's like Jesus is asking them. They were not to let their self-confidence lull them into sleep spiritually. Watch and pray. Pray specifically referring to the coming testings that they would go through. Why? Because the flesh is weak. <laughs> That's reality, folks. This old flesh, it's weak. Yet, yes, our spiritual lives are still attached to this weak flesh. We need to be aware of that. Look at verse 39. Again, he went away and prayed. This is the second time and spoke the same words, basically prayed the same way. And when he returned, he found them. <laughs> Steeled in prayer? No. He found them asleep again. For their eyes were heavy, they, they were literally, you ever say, you know, my eyes are heavy, I can't stay awake, you know, I'm weighted down with sleep, so to speak. Their, their eyes were heavy, and they did not know how to answer him. They didn't know how to answer him. They really had no answer from Jesus in light of their failure. So my question is, are you currently going through a trial because you know something is spiritually important, it's very heavy, it's weighty spiritually? And yet a family member or friend has no real comprehension what you're going through. It's like you're super burdened and they <laughs> could sleep <laughs> because it's not exercising them. You know, this is a form of spiritual suffering. You may be going through this right now because you're very disappointed that someone who should, should be praying for you is not. That is a form of spiritual suffering, but Jesus... <laughs> will make up for it through his grace if you cry out to him. My friend, if you are going through a spiritual suffering this morning, keep the faith. Keep the faith. Hebrews eleven six says, Without faith it's impossible to please him. For they that come to God must believe that he is, that he is a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. Verse 41 says this, And he came a third time. So he goes out. This is the third time Jesus is going out to pray. He wanted to make sure. The third time and said that, are you still, I hate that word, still, <laughs> are you still sleeping and resting? It is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. I love what MacArthur says here, kind of summarizes it. The three disciples remain indifferent, not only to the needs of Christ at that moment, but to their own need for strength and confidence and watchfulness for the impending temptation that all 11 of them would have to face. The disciples needed to learn that spiritual victory goes to those who are alert in prayer and depend upon God and that self-confidence 
And spiritual unpreparedness lead to spiritual disaster. Watch and pray. But they were still sleeping. Now there's a curious statement here. It is enough. Look at verse 41 again. Jesus said, it is enough. What's going on here? Well, I believe that Jesus now being fortified or steeled in spirit left the Garden of Gethsemane and he was triumphant in his commitment to do all that the Father had asked him to do. Jesus no longer needed the assurance of his disciples. In his humanity, he wanted those three men closest to him to to sympathize, to empathize, to, to, to shoulder the burden of prayer. But they fell asleep. It is enough. He no longer needed that assurance. The Father had spoken to his spirit from heaven. And in a sense, he's facing the trial with him. The betrayal was taking place at that very moment. The hour has come, he said. Jesus was so spiritually fortified that he was ultimately prepared for all of his coming suffering. He went out to drink the cup and win the greatest victory ever won. Jesus died on the cross. It's finished. It's over. You weren't here last Sunday then. Because <laughs> after the third day, he rose from the grave. One last verse, verse 42. The Bible says, he looks at his disciples, Jesus says, and rise, he commands them, hey, get up, come on. Get up, let us be going. See, look, behold, my betrayer is already at hand. Lord willing, next Sunday we'll preach on that, that unfortunate truth. Of Judas coming to betray him. But that's for next week. My betrayer is at hand. The Lord exhibited no fear in the face of death. Even though a mob of about 600 Roman soldiers. The temple police and antagonistic members of the Sanhedrin. Were coming to arrest him. Instead of running away from the cross. Jesus moved toward it with settled confidence. Consider um, what Jesus went through. So, the disciples, we're going to learn, they all flee. We know that by reading the Bible. Instead of standing with them, of course, Peter gets brave here. We'll talk about that next with the sword, but they're all going to depart. But was their failure final? Obviously not. As we mentioned last week, Peter was crucified upside down. James was killed by a sword. Although John lived a long life, he was exiled on the Isle of Pat- Patmos Every one of the 12, well, the 11 remaining disciples died, and you include Paul, you got 12. All of them died serving God. Paul Paul was stoned. Only one died a natural death, and that was John, and he was greatly persecuted. So my question is, have you steeled your mind through prayer? How active is your prayer life? Quick review. Jesus steeled his life through prayer. He calls his disciples to do the same. And they slept. Wow. Well, I think we can empathize with them somewhat if you're honest with your own humanity. So let's conclude the message with a few thoughts about this idea of stealing the church. My desire for Grace Baptist Church I am so thrilled. Our food bank, our missions program, we're going to talk more about our missions program in a little bit. So many things are going well. But could God use this church in a greater way than it's being used today? I say yes. But there has to be a stealing of the church, a f- spiritual fortification. So even in the concluding hours of Jesus' earthly life, he was still teaching the imperative of fervent prayer in the midst of spiritual warfare. How is your prayer life going? I want to show you something just for way of illustration. I have been getting requests from you. No name on this. You don't have to put your name on a connection card if you have a prayer burden. But I'm getting cards from the congregation saying, teach us about prayer. How do I pray effectively? This is the second one I've gotten in about a month or so. I love that. Now, if it had a name on it, I would call you personally and say, this is what we're doing. But in a general sense, I'll say, hey, don't miss Wednesday night. We're going to preach on corporate prayer right in this room, the upper room. We'll be having a shorter lesson on teaching about prayer because we want to leave plenty of time for prayer. I I like preaching. I I could preach longer, but I'd rather have the saints going through and obeying and getting the blessing of corporate prayer. If you're one of those that's turning in cards like this, come this Wednesday night. 
Get into a life group. There are many ways that you can grow in your prayer life and be taught about that. I want to mention that even for those who we would think are pretty spiritual, should be spiritual, prayer can be a battle. So I want to end with an illustration about a pastor. I don't know this man, but I read about him. His name is Dr. J. Sidlow Baxter. The story goes that he was a pastor back like in the 1920s and 30s. And he really wanted his church to, to grow and to be spiritual. He wanted to steal the church, make it strong. But he went to his desk and his desk was covered with letters he needed to respond to. Things he needed to organize. You get the point. And there was a temptation within him. And the temptation in his mind said something like this. You know what? It's important that you answer these people. It's important that you organize these events. You don't need to pray. You can skip prayer today. That was a thought, not a verbal thing, but it was a thought in his mind. And at that point, he said, that's it. He caught the devil, <laughs> so to speak. He said, that's it. You know what Paul said in 1 Timothy 4, 7? He said, discipline, the Greek word for discipline is where we get the word gymnastics. So discipline or gymnastize yourself in spiritual disciplines like prayer. Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness, Paul said in 1 Timothy 4, 7. Dr. J. Sidlow Baxter um, realized and he was horrified by his thinking that he could be busy for God but not praying to God. So he took a good look into his heart and he found there was a part of him that did not want to pray. And a part that did. It's, you know, two parts. The part that didn't want was his emotions. And the part that did was his intellect and his will. The analysis paved the way to victory. And here is his testimony. And I want to share it with you. Because I believe it will resonate with you. Because it did with me. As never before, my will and I stood face to face. I asked my will the straight question. Will, are you ready for an hour of prayer? Will answered, here I am. And I am quite ready. If you are. So Will and I linked arms and turned to go for our time of prayer. At once all the emotions began pulling the other way and protesting. We're not coming. I was, I was Will, stag I saw Will stagger just a bit. So I asked, can you stick it out, Will? And Will replied, yes, if you can. So Will went, got down to prayer, dragging those wriggling <laughs> emotions with us. It was a struggle all the way through. At one point, when Will and I were in the middle of our earnest intercession, I suddenly found one of those traitorous, uh, traitorous emotions had snared my imagination again and had run off to the golf course. And I was all I could do to drag that wicked rascal back. Don't tell me that you never prayed and have your mind be, dis have your mind be distracted. One of my favorite evangelists, Del Faisenfeld, would say, when I go to prayer, I take a pad of paper with me. And every time, whether it's of God or of the devil, every time I get a thought that would take me off of prayer, I'll write it down, something I need to do later. Just write it down, push it aside, and keep praying. This is what he's going through. A bit later, I found another of the emotions that sneaked away with some off-guard thoughts and was in the pulpit. And two days ahead of schedule, preaching a sermon that I had not yet finished preparing. Mind wondering, ever happened to you? Has to me. At the end of that hour, if you had asked me, have you had a good time? I would have had to have said no. It was been a time of wearying wrestle with contrary emotions and a, and a truant imagination from beginning to end. What is more, that battle with the emotions continued for about two to three weeks. Ouch. Would you have given up? And if you had asked me at the end of that period, have you had a good time in your daily praying? I would have had to confess no. At times it has seemed as though the heavens were brass and God too distant to hear. And the Lord Jesus strangely aloof and prayer accomplished nothing. Stay with me. Yet something was happening. For one thing, will, his will, and I really taught the emotions that we were completely independent of them. Amen. Also, one morning, about two weeks after the contest began, just when Will and I were going for another time of prayer, I overheard one of the emotions whisper to the other, 
come on, you guys. It's no use wasting any more time resisting. They'll just do the same. Wouldn't that be good? That morning, for the first time, even though the emotions were still suddenly uncooperative, they were at least silent, which allowed Will and me to get on with prayer undistractedly. Then another couple of weeks later, what do you think happened? During one of our prayer times when Will and I were no more thinking of the emotions than of the man on the moon, one of the most vigorous of the emotions unexpectedly sprang up and shouted, Hallelujah! At which time all the other emotions exclaimed, Amen! <laughs> and for the first time in the whole of my being, my intellect, my will, and emotions they were united in one coordinated prayer operation. All at once, God was real. Heaven was open. The Lord Jesus was luminously present. And the Holy Spirit was indeed moving through my longings. And prayer was surprisingly vital. Moreover, in that instant, there came a sudden realization that heaven had been watching and listening all the way through those days of struggle against chilling moods and mutinous emotions. Also that I have been undergoing necessary tutoring by my heavenly father. I just want to say to you this morning. If prayer is hard for you. I understand. But I haven't given up. In fact I've been challenged by godly people. And I'm trying to increase in areas of prayer. I, be good, I believe good personal devotions. It's not just praying. I believe Bible reading. I believe scripture memorization. I, I believe it's good to get a hymn book out and sing. Great way to praise the Lord. But we need to spend that time because if we're going to have the church that Jesus wants us to have, if we're going to be steeled, if we're going to be fortified spiritually, we're going to have to do what God said. We're going to have to pray. So let me exhort you. All of our life groups, if you're a leader in our life group, and I came to your life group, uh-oh. If I came to your life group, how much emphasis is there on prayer? I want every leader of life groups to think about that. Because when we met with you, before we ever started life groups, we talked about the emphasis of prayer. Oh, there's all kinds of things you'll do besides prayer. And different emphasis on the Bible or whatever. That's fine. But are you emphasizing prayer, leaders and students? How about your Bible study hour class? Oh, we're too much of a hurry today. Can't pray today. Now, we have to be careful too because we could take so many requests that there's not much time for teaching. We have to be balanced. But how about your Bible study hour class? Are you praying? You know, every Christian gathering can be a time for prayer. The stealing of the church. That's my prayer for my life, for you, for this church, that we might be greater, a greater tool in the hands of God. Let's bow for prayer. Father, thank you that we are called soldiers, but we don't always act like one. Thank you for this godly pastor who said he really struggled with prayer. Thank you for J. Vernon McGee who said, I can't go with Jesus through the garden. I can't suffer as he did. But God, your grace is sufficient for whatever we will have to go through. So I thank you in advance for how you will shield and sustain when we go through trials. Help us not to resist the process of spiritual growth, be it receiving trials, be it prayer, be it Bible reading, Bible memorization. Help us to do what you'd have us to do. Now, as your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, simple question. We've talked about all these spiritual realms, but my question to you is, do you have the precious spirit of God within you to help you do these things that are difficult, spiritually difficult, spiritual warfare? What I'm saying is, if you've never trusted Christ as Savior, you don't have the spiritual fortification of the Holy Spirit sealing you, empowering you within you. May I ask you a question? Are you sure if you died today, you'd go to heaven? If not, we can show you from the Bible how you can know that. Now, in the quietness of this moment, with heads bowed and eyes closed, how many of you would say, Pastor, I'm not sure about my eternal destiny. I'm not sure if I die today, I go to heaven. Please pray for me. If that's true about you, would you raise your hand? Just hold it there for a moment. I won't call you out by name or come to you. I just want to know if that's something that you're burdened about this morning. So Christians, here's my prayer. There's not a one of us that shouldn't ask God for more insight, more desire, more of the will controlling the emotions that we might be fervent in prayer and not falling asleep.
Jesus was steeled through prayer. The disciples slept. We're all on that continuum somewhere. Maybe some days we're on the, the good side of that continuum. Maybe some days or most days we're not. I don't know how God may have spoken to you, but the altar is open. And if you, like Ricky and Eliza last week, need to obey the Lord and believers' baptism, if you'd like to join the church, during the hymn of invitation, I invite you to obey God. Whatever he has put on your heart, do not delay. Let's stand with heads bowed and eyes closed. Everyone standing with heads bowed and eyes closed. Father, I pray that by the power of your spirit that you would have your will and your way in this invitation, that you would find an obedient heart within me and within all of us, that we would take whatever spiritual step you want us to take in Jesus' name. Now as the piano plays, whatever God has said to you, obey him for he is worthy. Jesus did his Father's will. May we also. how important it is that we take time to be holy that, that's an interesting song really every good thing takes time it takes time to pray Jesus took a full hour or more he, he went three times um, the indication it was well over an hour it could be up to three hours of praying for something spiritually heavy Lord I don't know what everyone in this room is going through but I do know that you care so God, may we come to you in humble, contrite prayer, admitting our need of you and asking you for help because God, you love and you care and we need to steal ourselves, strengthen ourselves in this realm. God, do it in me, do it in all of us that want to please you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Man, well, if you're a guest with us today, we're thrilled you're here. And we have a, here we go, there it is, a connection card to see back in front of you. We'd love to have you fill that out in just a moment here, and you can place those in the offering in just a few moments. Uh, that'll allow us to have a record of your visit and uh, get you more information about our ministries here and a gift for being with us. So I hope you'll take advantage of that. And also for all our folks, just as we heard about prayer this morning, we want to pray together as a church family. So we invite any of you to, uh, on the back side of that card, fill out any prayer requests, any updates you have. Um, so we can pray together about that as a church family. You can place those in the offering as well here in just a moment. Well, we're excited about the uh, services today. Uh, several things to bring to your attention. First of all, we're thrilled to have Jonathan Washer and his family here. He's with Inside the Lines Ministry. Uh, those are the ones we, we mentioned to you uh, the last few weeks. Uh, this weekend, they held a prison ministry right here in Denver, uh, getting, using, using sports, a volleyball tournament, a basketball tournament, and then presenting the gospel to the inmates. And they've seen so many people saved uh, through that ministry. And so we're delighted to have them with us here today. So you want to greet them this morning. But also, he's going to um, be speaking to our teens this morning. And so our teens can look forward to hearing from him. Uh, with what the Lord's laying on his heart, more about that ministry there. So teens, you can look forward to that this morning. Uh, tonight, we have our regular 5 o'clock service. The adults over here, Pastor Dave will be speaking on the life of Charles Spurgeon. It'll be a very interesting study there. Looking at how God used him. And of course, downstairs, we have uh, the children with Kids for Truth, teens, youth group, and the Hispanic service. And then as Pastor mentioned, this Wednesday night, uh, 6.30, right up here, uh, he'll be speaking on the, uh, the power of corporate prayer. And we get to put into action what we heard this morning. So I hope you can join us for that. And then wanted to mention, let's see, there we have a prayer request, is next Sunday we begin our new series on the life of David. We'll be going through the book of 2 Samuel, so looking forward to that. Of course, don't miss today as we finish up our series on trusting God, a wonderful lesson. Uh, looking forward to that as well. Well, this time I'll invite the gentleman to come forward as we receive our offering this morning. Very important part of our worship as we give to the Lord our tithes, our offering, our faith promise, giving for missions. Um, God is so worthy of everything. Everything comes from him. So it's our privilege to worship him by giving a part back to him. So Rodney, if you would, please ask the Lord's blessing on our offering this morning.
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for blessing us, allowing us to attend this worship service. We thank you for the message we receive. We thank you for the messenger. Now, Father, we ask that you would give us loving and giving hearts in the way that we greet people, the way that we shake someone's hand, Father, the way that we would just hug someone, the way that we would have loving ears. Now, Father, we ask that you would take this offering that we're about to receive uh, to further your kingdom. Amen. These and all of the blessings we ask in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, as you can see, we have our new verse here, and I want to say something about it. Um, we, verse 31 sets up this prayer, um, but I wanted to say that, you know, Simon, uh, Simon Peter, he was the wheat. I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not, um, but he was like the wheat being sifted, and his self-confidence was like the chaff, the part that needed to blow away. So if you memorize this I pray that you will, and uh, you get it down pretty quick. Memorize the verse before it, too, because it gives you the full context about uh, how Peter was going through a difficult time. You have Jesus, who was steeled in prayer, and you have others, the disciples, who were sleeping in prayer. And we need to be aware or, or beware of self-confidence. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Let's say this together, beginning with the reference. Luke twenty two thirty two. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Luke twenty two thirty two. Peter failed, but he didn't stay down. Nor should we. It's not our greatness or goodness, but it's a loving God forgiving us so we can take the next step to obey him. Um, well, I have to mention this because the guy said so. And I, I got to tell you about the ladies. So last Monday night, the ladies had 19, which is technically tying us. But they wanted, they were so earnest in beating us that they said they had 20. You, you know how they did that, Kelly? Because there was a lady teaching on the video and they counted her too. Now, I, 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 I don't know about this. And I'm not gloating or anything. Someone told me to gloat. <clears throat> but the men had, last Wednesday night, 25. So, ladies, that's your challenge for Monday night, okay? <laughs> we do praise the Lord for our life groups. I just, I love what's happening there. There's a dynamic there with a the smaller group interaction. Lots of people talking, lots of people sharing. Still, you can still get in on, on the ladies' Bible study Monday night. Of course, the men will be meeting a week from this Wednesday. Uh, faith promise. Boy, I'm excited about this. Please get out the green sheet that is in your um, bulletin. Now, if you're used to our church, you know that before we have a church vote, we do have a business meeting one week from today. But we can't ask you to vote on something you've never seen. So if you would take this sheet, and I'm just going to point out a few things. Go to number 10. These are all the missionaries we support. Uh, we are increasing the Horners. Oh, what we do is we send out a letter as a survey. We ask for current blessings. How are you doing? And what is your support level? 
every good mission board will say 100% of your support is like, let's say, $5,000 a month. So when we ask for their support level, it's 100, 95, 80. Sometimes they're down at 70, which is very dangerous. They may have to come off the field to raise more money so they can keep doing what God's called them to do. We surveyed our missionaries. Not everyone responded. Most did. But some of them were way behind. So look at number 10, which is the Horners. We've increased them by uh, $1,200 a year. Go to number 15, the Asoros. We're proposing that we can take them on for a good amount of $300 a month or $3,600 a year. They're new, and you get the chance to vote on this next week. But we are proposing, the, the missions committee and the pastors are proposing that we take on the Asoros. Now go to number 17. The Petersons were low and... Um, we're increasing them by 600 a year. The Reddicks were low as well, uh, increasing them by 1,200 a year. Go down to number 22. Uh, Dwayne and Hannah Scott, when we got their response, their support was pretty low, so we uh, bumped them up uh, 1,500. And then number 22, we just had Michael Smith here. He's starting that new trade school. Great things going on. I just read his, his letter this morning. We're increasing them by $600. Um, and then the things at the bottom, um, missions conference, with more and more we're doing, we had to increase that budget. But if you look at the bottom line, last year, the budget was 125000 Why are we going up 5000 Well, we always want to go up. But you, praise God, have pledged $5,000 more than you pledged last year. So it's only natural that our budget goes up 5000 Last thing I'll say is last year we had 35 cards turned in. One of the blessings I want to share is that every week, cards have come in. Every week, more cards have come in. So last year, we had 35 cards. As of last Sunday, we had 32 cards. So if you still want to be a part of our missions program, uh, there are the missions cards in the back of these chairs. It's a tan-colored card. You can give $5 a week, $10. You can give whatever God puts on your heart. But if you turn it in this week before Sunday then in our presentation, we'll show you the amount. Right now, we have enough. I'm very confident that we can go up to $5,000 because we have $5,000 more than we have last year. You say, well, how that could that be, Pastor? You have three cards less. Well, people are giving more, obviously, per family. We don't know what families give individually. We just put all the cards together. There's no name on there. It, this is fun for me, okay? This is fun because our burden is to get the gospel around the world, and you guys are making that possible. So please go home, pray about this, and then we will have a vote. We'll take questions from the floor, if there are any, and we will vote next Sunday. Um, thank you, Joel, for announcing about our, our emphasis this Wednesday night on prayer. If you want to grow in prayer, meet me in the, the upper room Wednesday night at 6.30. And um, uh, Joel, if you would come, let's stand together. As he is coming, we'll have our last song. Um, but don't miss Bible study hour. Why bad things happen to good people? What does God's word have to say about that? Your heart, I think, will be encouraged. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but has given us the strength to obey. May the Lord find us faithful. Let's sing it together. Hi, I'm Pastor Smith, and we're so glad that you chose to live stream with us today. Here at Grace Baptist Church, we are seeking to exalt the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. If there's any way that we can minister to you or your family, let us know. In a moment, you'll see on the screen our church address, phone number, more importantly, our website. On the website, you'll see who we are, what we believe, the ministries that we have for children, teens, adults. We have a wonderful nursery ministry. 
We just are a church seeking to help the community in any way that we can. So let us know. That's still 21. They still win. All right. So, but thank you so much for your hospitality allowing us to be here. Let's go to prayer. Lord, thank you. Thank you so much for the cross. Thank you. As you said, it is finished. Lord, thank you now that we can come boldly to the throne of grace. Thank you that now we can say, Abba, Father, that we 